We began at Star City, just outside Moscow. It's the home of the cosmonaut core, where all the cosmonauts prepare for their journey to space. The head of cosmonaut training is General Alexei Leonov, who is himself a pioneer cosmonaut and double hero of the Soviet Union. He likes to pull G in his Mercedes. The people of our star city, three and a half thousand people. We began this reconstruction, this star city in 1960. Thirty years before, at this place was a potatoes field. Now you see building for training facilities, orbital, st orbital station, and the Soyuz spacecraft. This is a cosmonaut li living area. The cosmonaut study and the laboratory and the space planetarium. What are training facilities? Water training facilities. This is building for uh, big centrifuge. Uh, I test uh, 14G myself. I have many, many regimes, especially when I preparing for moon expedition. In the Soviet Union, there is a deep-rooted passion for space exploration. But how did this vast space empire begin? What was the driving force? Leonov witnessed the origins of its spectacular success. He was the first man to walk in space. Before him was the first woman in space, Valentina Tereshkova. The first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. The first animal to orbit the Earth, Laika. And the first satellite, Sputnik. The string of firsts shocked the world. They were portrayed as a triumph of the communist system, yet they were the direct result of the energy and vision of one man. Among his secret circle of rocket engineers, he was a legend, but officially, he did not exist. He was known only by his title, Chief Designer. The political leaders insisted that he remain anonymous. Not till after his death was his identity revealed. His name was Sergei Pavlovich Korolyov. Korolyov's life is the story of the foundation of the Soviet space program. One of the few surviving cosmonauts who knew Sergei Korolyov is Alexei Leonov. Back in 1960, when the new cosmonaut recruits began training, even they were intrigued by the mystery surrounding the chief designer. They did not know what to expect when they met him for the first time. Вернее, в 60-м году осенью. Значит, должен быть главный конструктор. Его называли просто СП. Расшифровал Сергей Павлович, а фамилии мы его даже не знали. Увидели во дворе, приехал ЗИС-110, большой автомобиль правительственного класса. Выходит человек в темном пальто, шляпа широкополая, надвинутая на глаза, Здравствуйте, орелики. Мы в разнобой сказали здравствуйте. Глаза смотрели очень внимательно. Казалось бы, пронизывали насквозь. Мы сразу поняли, что не зря Сергей Павлович главный конструктор, но и видели в нем еще и очень требовательного человека, требовательного отца. Вот с первого взгляда мы решили, что это наш отец. И с этих позиций дальше вся наша жизнь... The boy who was destined to be the father of space travel was a child of the aviation age. As an adolescent, the repercussions of the revolution mattered less to him than his fascination with aeroplanes. His first love was flying, and in Odessa he used to persuade the flying boat pilots to take him up for joyrides. Not content with flying planes, he wanted to design them too. He built and flew his own glider when he was 19 years old.
He knew that escaping Earth's gravity and flying to space was theoretically possible. But in the 20s, it seemed like science fiction. In 1926, Korolyov went to Moscow to study aircraft design. But he dreamed of designing spacecraft which could travel at speeds of 20,000 miles per hour and go into Earth orbit. His first step down this path came when he was asked to join an exclusive band of young engineers driven by the idea of building rockets. They all knew that rockets were the only sort of engine capable of operating in the vacuum of space. The group called themselves GERD. They fired their first rockets 20 miles from Moscow in the heart of what is now the Nakabino military base. For Jim Oberg, this is a pilgrimage to a sacred place. Oberg is a NASA mission controller from Houston. He has spent the last 20 years investigating the history of the Soviet space program. He was one of the first in the West to publish episodes of Korolyov's life that were missing from the official Soviet histories. Korolyov, Sander, Tikhonov. This is the place where Korolyov and the Gerd group lit the fuses of their first liquid-fueled rocket. Here, the seeds of today's space program were sown. Well, the men and women who built these rockets were a group of real fanatics and, and dedicated to it, and they had to be because there was not a lot of official support for it. They received no salaries, and the getting materials to build the rocket and the control system was a big challenge to them. They would melt down family jewelry, for example, to get some silver. So they do all these things. They made a joke about it. The initials geared stand for formally the group of engineers developing on, on rocket propulsion. But they said it meant the group of engineers working for free because they, they did that. They were dedicated. And for some of them, like Korolev, his entire life was spent from here on building these kind of rockets. And everything else was sacrificed. Korolev clearly was the star. And he became the, the chief engineer. He knew how to solve the problems. But it's a very special kind of skill as an engineer to look at a challenging problem and say, well, where, what pieces do we solve first? And where do you put the resources? And Korolev here cut his teeth on this kind of techniques that he later used to open the space frontier. Their first rockets barely escaped the treetops. So they were a long way from attaining large enough speeds to reach space. But they had learned how to control the potentially explosive fuel mixture. And by 1933, under Korolev's leadership, their rockets could reach speeds of 2,000 miles per hour. The success of the GERD group started to interest the highest echelons of the Red Army. With military backing, they were transformed into a well-funded rocket research institute for producing weapons. So any idea of space travel took a backward step. Moreover, for Korolev, who had been given a military rank, the army would turn out to be a dangerous friend. Marshal Tukhachevsky, the commander-in-chief of the Red Army, had personally backed Korolev's rocket group. In a fit of paranoia, Stalin had decided that Tukhachevsky and his officers were plotting to overthrow the state. Tukhachevsky was shot, and Stalin ordered the systematic annihilation of anyone else under suspicion. Many innocent officers faced show trials. Half the entire officer corps was executed. Korolev and his family would become a target. Начались массовые аресты среди работников ракетного дела, того института, в котором он работал. И, честно сказать, все ждали, что очередь наступит и его. 
Это было 27 июня. Вечером я возвращалась поздно с работы и увидела, что уже стоят два человека у подъезда дома. The Korolyovs lived in a small Moscow apartment. For Mrs. Korolyov, returning there evokes memories of a terrible night. 